Konbanwa, everyone. My name is Nicolo Bartolazzi, and I decided that we are going to take our class on Kyogen, Japanese Kyogen, online today, so that all of you can see. I'm joined today by my fellows, my fellow players of the patchwork in Iverde Confusi. Iverde Confusi, introduce yourselves, please. I'm James in the SCA, also known as Chuck. I'm Alienor in the Society for Creative Anachronism. In the mundane world, you can call me Megan. I'm Aaron, and in the SCA, I'm also Aaron because I haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> and we are Iverdi Confusi. Thank you, Iverdi Confusi. As you can tell, we are social distancing in different locations, but the other members of our troupe have agreed to help demonstrate this art form for us today. So this class is going to be mostly lecture, but there will be a short demonstration later on where I will be showing off one of the most well-known Kilgan plays. So we'll be seeing the Greenies in just a few minutes again, but for now, let's get started. So, Kyogen. Kyogen is literally mad words. That is actually what the characters of Kyogen represent. It is an art form from Japan that is theatrical, comedic, and meant to, meant to be a release and bring forth some joy. Now, if those of you who wish to follow along with some of my notes, once it will actually change screens, there. If you go to bit.ly slash 2016 mad words, you should be able to download a PDF of this class. And then you can follow, there'll be some more notes in the class than what we're gonna cover today, more details, but you can also follow that. So that's bit dot ly slash 2016 mad words. All right, there may be a few technical glitches we're still gonna use to having a teacher over Zoom. Normally we teach this class in person, but let's get to the nitty gritty of everything that we wish to know. I'm sure many of you have already heard of no theater. It is a more well-known type, type of theater in Japan here in, here in the United States. But technically it's not just no, it is actually no Kyogen because the two art forms are closely related. No Kyogen, hold on everyone, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a Zoom problem. Um, I'm trying to get that to actually go right. Um, so Nil Kyogen is a centuries old art form from, from Japan, as I said. It is staged together, although they are very different arts. Those of you who know know, it is a much more serious, often tragic form of art. It's very stylistic. It usually involves a bit of musical chant and musical instruments. It is often much longer. It is sometimes considered meditative. And it is what it is usually considered one of the great forms of art in Japan. Up, also up there with kabuki, which is maybe more popular in recent centuries, but you will often see no discuss when having a cursory examination of Japanese performing arts. But if you go into the deep of it, it is a shared art with Kyogen. For what they typically would do is they would want to have a full festival of a day where you have a serious no play and then a comedic Kyogen play, which was much shorter and much more joyful in the middle. That way you could have a relief from a more stressful, more traumatic, more dramatic, more serious, and much, much longer no plays. But, so this shared art form, we'll be focusing on Kyogen, but we'll talk a little bit about no. This mad words, this wild speech, this farce, this, this fake performance, what is it? Well, to do that, we need to go back to to what performing arts is in Japan. And that's where I like to say we start with the monkey business of theater that pre predated Kyogen. Like many cultures, Japan 
did not, Japan started their interest in performing arts through festivals, through um, usually religious ceremonies like spring harvests. They would often be intertwined with religion, religious customs. The nomadic people of the Jomon period, so this is before 250 BCE, were practicing shamanistic dances for their various rituals. Um, as time went on into the Yaoi period, which, and which went through about 300 current era, as, as an agricultural culture emer emerged, it created both a cycle class and seasonal celebrations and festivals. So whenever you had these rituals and these festivals, you would end up with song and dance, usually encouraging some good fortune, usually encouraging thankful for the harvest. Um, you often ended up having uh, this increased the idea of some entertainment, this increased the idea of trying to maybe give thank your workers if you happen to, to be a landowner, because once you get an agrarian society, you do get landowners. So this is also the rise of the time of the Miko, the, the priestess. And they often did perform with song and dance. And this became some, this became not just religious, but also entertainment. It was around this time that, that there was a lot more contact between Japan and China. And China was considered to be the center of civilization for the world. So lots of the wealthiest and elite in, in early Japan wanted to emulate China. They wanted to impress anybody visiting from China, so they would schedule entertainment for them. So it was also about around now that we start to see the, the religion of the time being a bit solidified. So now we're into the Kupan period, which starts around the year 300. This is where we start getting stories of Amaterasu, the sun, go sun goddess, which is one of the most important, important in the pantheon of Japanese Shinto religion. The, one of the most famous stories from Amaterasu was when she was mocked and pranked by her brother, so she hid herself away in a cave, and she refused to come out. And because of that, the world was cast into darkness. So the other gods and kami, they tried to bring her back out. And there's many stories about how they did this, but one, one attempt was to do stage performances to bring her back out. They would, they tried to do entertain her with song and dance, including, including more joking and comedic performances. But one story has they chose a dry riverbed. This is a location that would be considered a performing arts location for centuries to come. And they would, um, one idea even had turning a bucket on its head, dancing on top of the bucket to encourage, encourage the goddess to come out. That is, also, again, a custom in Japan is dancing on top of a bucket as sort of a joy, joyful uh, performance. The reasons why is as an element of sympathetic magic, because if you were able to bring joy into the world, then anybody seeing this should also want to feel joy because it's a joyful world. So the idea was to try to get Amaterasu to feel joy and come back out again. And this ended up being mimicked by um by the Miko dancers and there was a, this ended up becoming a term also for other dance for other performers the uh, wazaogi um they were a type of performer that often did this more mirthful comedic comedic legend this continued to influence also other divine stories the godly brothers umasachi and yamasachi they ended up in a quarrel and the one had to become the, the aforementioned Wazaogi um, after, after they lost a bet. And that was considered to be, in legend, the first basic gesture, the first uh, required you now perform for us. Um, this may have actually been a representation of a story that is historical of when the Hayato clan was, was forced into becoming basically the court gestures and pantomimes for the victorious Yamato clan after a conflict. So now as we go forward into the Heian period, which is starts at the end of the 8th century and continues to near the end of the 12th century, Japan was increasingly influenced by Chinese culture. And they wanted it. They wanted the culture. This is when we start to see literature come over, usually in the form of Buddhist scriptures, which brought forth the written language of Japan, brought forth a new religion, brought forth literature, brought forth lots of art, and also brought forth uh, sanyao, 
which is Chinese for miscellaneous music or scattered music. And in Japan, it became known as Sangaku. And it was just basically a rhythm, rhythm and posturing beat of a drum. It was very popular in, China, in Chinese court. And of course, Japan grabbed onto it because they, because they wanted to get this culture, but they started adding onto it various folk elements, which included acrobats, tumblers, jugglers, musicians, and more. And because of all this, before the end of the 12th century, the term Sangaku became corrupted into Sarugaku. We don't entirely know why, but saru is the Japanese word for monkey. Now, it's possible that sarugaku was called that because by this point it was considered to be uh, buffoonish. It was considered to be ludicrous and foolish antics. It was, it was comedic completely. So it was basically monkey business. Um, it's also possible that some of the performers dressed like monkeys and some of the performers had trained monkeys that went with them. It's, it's possible that they, they had these monkeys because it was now being called Sarugaku. Whatever the reason why, now Sangaku is known as Sarugaku and is applied to any foolish and noisy merrymaking. So, uh, Sarugaku, which I would actually wish to explore more um, in more detail, because as one poet put it, uh, is to twist the entrails and dislocate the jaws of the specter with foolish nonsense. That sounds amazing. But that's that's probably more for another class. But remember that the Sarugaku at this time was very, very popular in the comedic courts, the high courts of Japan, the comedic courts, the high courts of Japan. And it was actually probably a bit salacious of body, which would be dropped by the time we get to Kyogen proper. But that was the case during the Heian period in the Kamakura period which is from the late 12th century into mid-ish 14th century. There was an overthrow, after this point, there was an overthrow in the government. So lots of people who were protected under the old government are no longer protected and fled the cities and fled the capitals. This included a lot of the Sarugaku performers. And they ended up having to escape and move to rural areas. And this is when they became uh, Hoshi Birara. Um, and to, escape some persecution. They often did disguise themselves as monks, though they weren't necessarily associated with any religious order. Um, part of this was because usually religious orders were better protected, also because this way they could try to earn money in various means. This is not the only place that has happened. I've studied other cultures where performers often enact some religious duties, even if they're not ordained or whatever the culture has for that. Part of it's because if you actually wish to um, if you if you wish to earn money, you're going to do whatever whatever. If you're itinerant and you wish to earn money, you're going to do whatever the locals would like you to do. If they wish to pay you to entertain them, sure. If they wish you to, to if they wish to pay you to give a ritual performance for a festival or a harvest, well, if you want to eat, you're going to do that too. And as we started, there's a lot of lot of ties between uh, Shinto festival ritual performance and regular performing arts. So there wasn't a, that too difficult of an overlap. Um, as time went on, they would start to actually learn um, a lot of these ritual arts. So we're now we're looking into centuries ago on, many of them do practice a lot of these rituals. So they do both performances and the rituals. Of course, as I said, they're willing to do whatever it takes to make, takes to make money. So they would do uh, religious rites and they would still do acrobats and they would still do pantomimes. And then um, they would do shows and singing and dancing, whatever it took. But since they would do whatever the people wanted, they became very popular among these people. And so again, as time went on, they found their way um, going up the social ladder once again, finding ways to make, uh, to join up with very influential families, um, actually being associated with proper religious orders, getting better um, masks, costumes, musical instruments, um, despite that sometimes they was to the annoyance of actual temples because they were considered false, but it was during these times that they did sort of rise to power. Into the Muromachi period, which is the next stage that goes from um, mid-ish 14th century to late 16th century, they, uh, they sought to now embrace a lot more Japanese traditional influence. 
Um, so they embraced uh, local folklore, they saw increased patronage from temples and shrines and government leaders, and they were once again protected by the leaders of Japan. So then they were now able to um, hone their talents. And of course, when you're working for the high class, that sometimes means that you, you need to release some of your buffoonery. Depends upon if they want something more, more high class than just a comedic slapstick routine. So some of the monkeyish traits of Sadagatu kind of faded away. And we saw them incorporating elements from the um, Inan, excuse me, the Inan uh, prayers, which is sort of a dramatic um, poetry telling as a performance. They also grabbed in um, now more emphasis on plot and storylines because many of those poems had stories. So we saw the comedic elements, but now some were becoming more serious and tragic. Uh, this is the point when Sarugaku could be said to be split into two crafts, Hongai and Nilgai. Hongai being the principal craft and Nilgai being the refined craft. Hongai is with mixed humor with performing arts at Shinto festivals, whereas Nongai combines song and dance with tragic stories from history and legend. As such, Hongai and Nogai would respectively give rise to what we call Kyogen and No. Now at this time, they still weren't actually called Kyogen and No. That's actually a later term. It's not in SCA period. But for our sake, we're going to start calling it now because we're about to move into when it becomes a very defined change. Now in period, it still would probably have been called Sarugaku or um, uh, Dangaku. Um, but also definitely Hogai and Nogai. Um, but we will start calling it No and Kyogen. Luckily, we happen to know a fairly exact date for when this happened. It was in the year 1374, and the great um, uh, Sarugaku actor and instructor and leader, Kanami Kiyotsugu, and his son, Ziami, were invited to perform for the young shogun. And their performance was so good, basically on the spot, the shogun said he wished to give, um, he wished to become the patron of both Kayami and his son Ziami. Some think it's because he was just incredibly impressed with the young boy who was nine or, ten, nine or 11, the documents are a little unsure, but the fact that he was so young and such a powerful actor is what really sold the shogun. So they were immediately brought into the court, and now they now they were completely protected by the government of the land. They were they were within the blessings and interest of the most powerful man in Japan. Because at this time, the emperor is not the most powerful person. The shogun is the most powerful person, and he embraced them and their court, and he wanted them to do more. This this enabled um, Kanami to refine the art and teach his son Ziyami in such a wealthy and well-educated uh, world. And Ziyami now had the, this access to this education in more literature. And thus, this is why we say perfecting this is where the branches of Sarugaku became what we call No and Kyogen. Now, part of the change also happened because the Shogunate's court was guided by the Zen aesthetics of Buddhism. So Kayami and Ziyami decided that they needed to add some Zen to their audience, to add some Zen to their shows for their audience. This, this encouraged them to express some restraint from some of the more exaggerated emotions and humor from the, from the earlier Sadugaku and Dengaku. Um, the more tragic the plays, the plays still became no, and the comedic plays became Kyogen. Um, though comedic Ziyami's beloved, uh, Zami believed Kyogen humor should still kindle the mind to laughter and a laughter that makes the laughter joyous. Now, Ziyami said that he was against raucous and rowdy laughter and that the goal, that the goal was, was not to produce laughter from the audience, um, just to sort of give a mirth and a, a wistful um, joy. He looked for a tinge of reality and he said, Neither in speech nor in gesture should there be anything low. The jokes in repart repartee should be appropriate even to the ears of the nobles and the refined. However funny they may be, one should never introduce the vulgar. This is the utmost importance to bear in mind. 
this is one of those more or less guiding rules that we have when it comes to Kyogen. It is not vulgar. It is not body. Now, we in Iverdi Confuzi often do Commedia dell'arte. And you'll start to see why we who embrace Commedia love Kyogen. Commedia is often very, very body and salacious and even scandalous, but Kyogen is not. Now, we disagree with the whole should not provoke laughter because many of these plays are incredibly hilarious, especially with their farcical, farcical elements. How they thought they didn't produce laughter, I don't know. If you watch a modern day Kyogen performance by professionals, yes, it is very, very funny. But it is true that we do strive to keep it not body, not vulgar. That is definitely very, very important to us. So that's sort of the, these are the guy, part of the guidelines that Zayami, Zayami set down that have been followed today. And not just by us and other people who are trying to replicate this 16th century period work. It is also what um, is done in Japan because um, a lot of, there's many schools that do both no and Kyogen today that have been doing them for centuries. And they have been following this same, this same overall model. So now that we've introduced Noen Kyogen, now it's been defined in history, we're in the 15th century, and many Sarugaku and Dengaku players who had been attached to the rural, rural shrines, they migrated to the capital in Kyoto because this was now considered the home for this new Noen Kyogen art. And their regional differences is what, what would cause these different schools, some of which I said are still around today, because the different schools would just look at it a bit differently. And at this time in SCA period, which is important for what we do, Kyogen was seen, was meant to be seen live and not read. So a rich, so even today, it's, there's not, okay, let me use the phrase. There are scripts. You can find them in books and library and download them all online. However, most professionals would not say to use a script if you wish to perform. What they do today is they still have a master re repeat the lines and an apprentice learn it by rote. Back in the 15th century, um, they did not actually even do that much. They had it all be a basic outline, a just a summary of the action and they would improvise um, the specific dialogue action and comedy. That is very similar to the art form that we do so much, Commedia dell'arte. And so in period, Kyogen was a lot less scripted and a lot more improvised, which is what you'll see when we demonstrate it in a few minutes. Um, now, as time went on, um, each generation was considered to be able to tailor the performance to suit the occasion, especially the audience. Um, Ziami did believe that it was the sole responsibility of the actor um, as an officer of, of the Kyogen. The chief function is that of merrymaker and drawing room gesture, who makes up entertainment scene by means of old antidotes and incidents. So at this time, it was not, it was more about, as a later writer would put it, not presenting a play which already existed, but rather an impromptu performance of something amusing for that particular occasion. So if anything was written down about Kyogen, it was more of an afterthought. It was more of discussing what had happened. It was, hey, we just did this great play. Let's write down an idea for it. Um, it really ended up happening post-period. Uh, so um, in, the, in the mid 17th century, so after SCA period, that um, Okura Toraki wrote the text of 203 plays of Kyogen which he did so because he felt he did not have a good memory. So he, but he, he said, I don't want anyone else to ever read this. This is for my own benefit because I need to review it. I can't just listen to it. At the, but he, he it was very much against policy. You should not write, write it down. Well, soon though, somebody said, well, these are great writings. I think that we perfected Kyogen. We shouldn't really continue to adapt it. So at this point they did become more memorized. But it is important to say that in period, they were not memorized. Um, they were, it was mostly improvisational. And that's what we like to look at because one, we are an improvisational troupe. And it's the art form we like the most. And two, we're not professionals. So it's a lot easier for us to just do an improvised uh, sketch. As I said earlier, um, uh, knowing Kyogen, I did operate in tandem 
you'd have a no performance, then you'd have a Kilgan performance, no performance, Kilgan performance, usually um, several throughout the day. They often had a specific, they often had a specific order. There's a few different orders. So you would get um, a, for example, they would always, some schools would always have a uh, farming Kilgan first, and then a husband wife Kilgan second, et cetera, et cetera. We'll go into the specific types of Kilgan in a few minutes. But I'm sure you're asking though, what exactly is Kilgan? How does it work? Well, we are gonna demonstrate in a moment, but first I do wish to want to show you what you'll be looking at. Now you aren't necessarily going to be able to see it quite so well because we d obviously do not have a proper stage. Um, but let me now show you what a Kilgan stage could look like once I get it to load. Here we go. So this is a no Kilgan stage. Now you're gonna be seeing our actors try to represent this as best as we can um, in the staging that we have. Now we've done this before in SCA events where we've had performances and representation, and usually we have to make do because we're not gonna have anything perfect. Well, trying to capture everything in our social distancing home on a laptop's camera will make do. But the reason I like to show this stage is because pretty much every no Kyogen stage in Japan is like this. Uh, so what you see in the upper, uh, the upper corner uh, under you, that's basically the backstage green room. Actors would come down a bridgeway, and it was often a very visible bridgeway, and then they enter the stage. Now the stage itself is a um, slight, slight rectangle. You can ignore the areas off the rectangle because they're less important for Kyogen. That's the areas of J and H on the screen are where musicians would sit. So we're looking at the area of A, the main stage. As you see, there are four squares around this main stage that are marked in red, B, C, D, and E. Those are the posts or pillars. Those were actual pillars on the edge of the stage. One, it was to keep the roof up because they actually had a very um, nice looking roof. If I can get to the next slide, I can show you an example. So this is how it looks from the front. As you see, they also they often have very elaborate, very pretty roofs. Part of the purpose of these of this is to sort of mimic looking like a shrine or a temple. Okay. Um, but the other purpose is these provide your sight lines, so you could see um, where the edge of the stage was. Um, at, audiences would sit in the areas of both Z and Y, so they would sit. Um, in front of the stage, like a traditional proscenium theater. They would also sit off to the uh, stage right, the, the actor stage right. They would not sit off the actor stage left. So you had actors on the two sides and you had openings on those two sides. The pillars were sight lines not fall off the stage, but also for actors. Actors would often, especially in Kilgan, act at certain pillars. And it was a, there was a tradition, and we'll discuss that when going into um, uh, the demonstration in a moment. Um, but what, what you should know is that typically actors would come in over the bridge, enter at pillar B, approach pillar C to give some introduction, approach pillar D to give some conflict, and then when they had to either circle the stage or exit, they would take a bit of a, think of it like a bow, like for bow and arrow, a bow-shaped path that would not cross center stage, but not go to E, back to B. The reason why is because if you walk straight from D to E, your back would be to the audience completely. So there's almost never any actual action at the fourth pillar, pillar E. So try to remember this as we get into the next stage, as we get into the demonstration. So with that being said, I now request that the members of E Verity Confusi um, return so that we can show off a little bit. I'm going to be pausing them at times. Okay, I'm trying to get them back. Uh, that I'm going to be pausing them during their performance at times. Um, they are still muted. <laughs> okay, they're unmuted now. Uh, like I said, we do comedy. 
So <laughs> what I'm going to have is have them demonstrate uh, a play called Busu, which is one of the fairly well-known plays of Kyogen, especially outside of Japan, and is um, it's it's very it's it's probably one of the I said well-known plays, and it's funny, and this will hopefully give a bit of demonstration. You'll see me coming back to explain some of what you're seeing. Now, just remember, this is not a proper stage. They do not have nearly the proper stage dimensions, so we're going to have to make do. All right, so with much further ado, I, am, I ask you very to confuse you to help out and demonstrate the play Busu, also known as A Tasty Poison. I'll be back. Greetings. I am the head of a fine and noble house. Here, I have a wonderful gift. This gift given to me by the daimyo. A gift of honey. Very good honey. And I see, you know, since this is a gift given to me by the daimyo for my services rendered, I don't see a reason in sharing it. But my servants are so curious, and they get into so many of my things. All right, Freeze. So, as you just saw, um, the master of the household, which is one of the more common characters seen in Kyogen, entered back near the back of the stage at what is called the first pillar, approached the second pillar while introducing themselves, then approached the third pillar where they are right now to discuss the problem. Now, this is very common where you'll see a character will come in, address the audience. Usually this is a very much, we like to say in other theaters is breaking the fourth wall, but Kilgan is basically doing exposition to the audience. They are talking directly to the audience, explaining the problem. So this is what's happening here. And they often do these at these two pillars. They, now that um, the master of the house is at the is at the third pillar, they will call in the servants. But before they do that, I did want to also stress this is a common conflict that happens in Japan in, in Japanese Kyogen. It's because of a Japanese uh, custom. If you're given a gift, it is customary to go off and give thanks for that gift. The problem that the master has in plays like these is for him to leave to go give thanks, which he feels obligated to do because. It is tradition, especially if you're high ranking like this, you need to leave your servants in charge of the house. And if your servants are archetypal foolish characters, you're a little bit worried about that. All right, continue. So in order for me to leave, see, give thanks to the daimyo for this wonderful gift, I come up with that. I have to call in my servants. Tarakaja, Jirakaja, come. Yes, Master. Yes, Master. Hold, freeze. Now, so this is Tarakaja and Jirakaja. As you see, their movement was was different than the Master's. If we had a more full video, it would demonstrate a lot more of the stylized movements of Kyogen. Um, but Characters like this are going to move a little bit differently. One, they're probably going to walk, they're going to try to mimic walking like servants who work in a rice field. Now, they may not do that, but the idea is just to pick up your feet to avoid the water and the mud. So they're doing a little bit of a, a hoppy motion as they came in. But you did see that they also came in from that first pillar in the back, went to the second pillar near the front, and then over to the third pillar. They didn't actually just cross straight over. They still followed the pillar format. Uh, I also want to add, they're, they're, these characters have names. Most Kyogen doesn't. Most Kyogen is just a who they are. Master, priest, um, shyster, accountant, uh, traveler, etc. They don't husband, wife, father. They don't generally have names unless there's something important like a particular god. But even then, they sometimes just a generic god. In this case, though, they sort of have names. Um, Taro Kaja, Jiro Kaja, and there's a few other Kaja. 
they're almost not names because it basically is just means any old boy. Taro Kaja is just basically any old boy. It's almost like saying any Tom, Dick, or Harry. So they sort of have names, but even those names are more occupations, or at least character types. All right. Continue, please. Now, called you in, I must run an errand to town. Oh, does that mean we're in charge? We're in charge. I'll be leaving you here, but there's something important I must tell you. Oh, what is it, Master? This small jar, right here. This jar, mm -hmm. this jar yep. contains a deadly poison. <laughs> So, you must not touch this job. Don't worry, Master. Don't worry, Master. So, I'll Don't be worry. leaving. Leave this jar alone. Stay closed. The fumes would surely kill you in an instant. I'll be back. All right, pause. So as you saw how the master left, it was probably not entirely clear because of the video like this and because they don't have a very deep stage, but the master left in that bow fashion. So if you pretend that what you see is the stage. Um, so if this is the, the front of the stage and this is the back of the stage, um, the master would have been here and crossed over to here. Apologies if this is reversed because I'm near. Um, didn't go back here to this way, but just sort of a bow shape around stage center to, to exit. Uh, that is very important because oftentimes in Kyogen plays, characters will travel and they won't actually leave stage, but they're traveling from one town to another. And they'll still do this motion where they'll go to from first, second, third, and then a little bit of an arch back to first, and then repeat until they reach a destination. And they almost never reverse it when they're traveling. When, when there's chaos going on on stage and characters are running around, yes, they can go anywhere. But usually if you're traveling someplace, you follow this pattern. Even if you're now returning to your original place, you still travel in that direction. It's a very um, counterclockwise direction. <laughs> yeah, I had to think about that because I'm so mirrored right now. All right, they're probably hurting from being paused, paused for so long, so let's have them continue. Oh, hello. Mr. Akasha? We need a plan. We need a plan. Yeah. The master, he left us alone. It's poison. Oh, what do we do? What do we do? I don't want to die. I don't want to die either. I have an idea. What is it? We need to make sure that it's closed. Yeah, the fumes will kill us. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that it's closed because that way the fumes might not kill us. Oh, okay. So, but what if it's not closed? Well, you better check it. I don't want to check it. You check it. Uh, I have to check it. Mm -hmm. well, you check it. Okay, but you, you fan the fumes away so I don't die. I'll fan the fumes away and you check and make sure that the lid is closed. Okay. Keep, keep fanning, keep fanning. Keep checking. Is it closed? Is it shut? Is it shut? Keep panning, keep panning. Is it shut? Is it shut? Uh, uh, Did you check? Uh, pause. Now, what you saw there, where keep panning, keep panning, is it shut? Is it shut? Keep panning, keep panning, is it shut? Is it shut? That is a very, very common um, element of Kyogen. Now, I can't say for sure that's period, especially back when it was improvised, though there is lots of, lots of um, examples of repetition like that, even in improvised performances. You could sort of consider it a bit of a stylistic running gag, where you'll have two characters go back and forth, repeating the same lines over and over again. And it's usually that motion of line A, line A, line B, line B, line A, line A, line B, line B. It gives a rhythm going, especially during energetic scenes. It is heavily used by foolish characters like these, but it is not exclusively used. Now, I couldn't figure out a good way to demonstrate that in this particular play. We have some similar ones that could, but this would also be a good time to talk about the fact that um, if they had to make sound effects, like if they wanted to actually be making the fan sound effects, 
they would they would not just they would be speaking the onomatopoeia. Um, that is, and it would be more vocalized than we have. Like if we're trying to make a sound effect like a fan, we could be going or you know something like that. They would actually vocalize it, and I don't know off the top of my head what the Japanese words would be for it, but it would be some something like 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 wave wave, you know the the equivalent. So there is also this element of the theatricality of utilizing it. So it could be blow, blow, wave, wave, or something like that, which would also be repeated in a similar situation. All right, let's get back to it. Let's see if they survive the deadly poison. Huh? I might have loosened it. You might have loosened it? I might have loosened it. You made it worse. Maybe. Oh, fine. You fan the flame, the, the, the fumes away, and I'll check it. Okay, you switch with me. <laughs> Keep panning, keep panning. Is it shut? Is it shut? Keep panning, keep panning. Is it shut? Is it shut? I opened it, I opened it. Oh, no, oh, it's all over you. I got an army on it, I got an army on it. It's all over you, it's all over you. Oh no, oh, my best friend's gonna die. use their fans as actual fans. Well, now you're seeing the same fans used as something else. Now that brings one of my actually favorite elements of Kyogen. The fan is your most important prop. Some Kyogen plays, like even this one here, which actually has a pot, will have um, definitive uh, props and set pieces. It could be swords, it could be poles, etc. But most of the time, this is your prop. And this can be almost anything. Now, as we saw, it was a fan, but it could also be, now this could be a little hard because of the screen. It could be a plate, it could be a cup, it could be a face mask, which we should all have face masks, but I don't recommend using a Japanese folding fan. It's not really gonna protect you. It could be a hat. It could be a spoon or a fork or a knife, especially in this format. It could be a sword. Um, it could be various, whatever else you can think of that's necessary. Um, arrows, like I said, shield, signs, paper to write down on. Every actor in Kyogen would have a fan. And our fans are usually fairly simple, but the Kyogen actors, their fans would often represent their characters. So each character would have a different type of fan. And you could even say it's a bit of a symbol for Kyogen at this point because, and not just Kyogen, other art forms definitely used fans too, um, but utilizing it as a prop, uh, that was very, very, very common. So for Kyogen, it is the, you know, mass, the mass, master anything you want kind of prop. Part of it also just makes sense because fans were on almost everyone. Almost every person, especially of higher standing, would carry a fan. Part of that was because they obviously are useful. Part of it was just because they are pretty and you can show off. But they would, in many situations, also be used as an equivalent to a sword. Sometimes you may have had to not be carrying your sword or you were of a class prohibited to have a sword. And the fan obviously isn't a good weapon, although there are weaponized fans, these ones aren't. Um, but what you would do instead is you would still have a fan to sort of represent um, represent your standing in your class. So for many of the higher classes, you would always carry a fan. It'd be just very important. So in Kyogen, everyone still carries a fan. It's just that now the fans, it's props to represent everything. All right, let's continue as they eat the tasty poison. This is the tastiest poison I've ever eaten. I know. It's, 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 it's empty. It's, it's empty? It's, Completely empty. 
Oh, this is not good. You know, the master's poison. Oh, the master's gonna be really, really mad at us. He's gonna kill us. What do, what do we do? What do we, what do we do to our gotcha? I don't, I don't want to die of the master killing us. I don't want to die from the master killing us either. What do we do? What do we do? I got an idea. I got an idea. That won't work. Oh, I got an idea. I got an idea. That definitely won't work. Oh. I got a better idea. Yeah. You see that tea set right over there? Uh huh. The master's tea set. Uh huh. I want you to knock it down on the floor. Uh, okay. Crash, 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 crash. That felt good. And you see that scroll over there? Oh, the yeah. one that he got from the daimyo a few years ago? Oh, it's beautiful. Take it out the wall uh -huh. and rip it to pieces. <laughs> for a second, I want to talk about that ending, because the vast majority of Kyogen plays end with characters running off in a chase sequence. As you saw, they still did that counterclockwise motion around the center of the stage before they all ran off. So, end of the chase, pretty common. 
All right. Now, if everyone can join me, let's give a round of applause to my Iverdi Kunduzi for agreeing to do this. And they traditionally would be doing a Cezanne bow, which is what you've probably seen with martial arts. But that if is we did a Cezanne bow, we would have this way down here. Yeah. And it wouldn't go on over very well on video. No, but, but, but a Cezanne bow, just like in martial arts, is traditional for performing arts, especially Kyogen. So um, as you saw with Busu, most of that humor is fairly universal. It, when I first actually heard about Busu, it was when I was looking up medieval plays for, the, for a branch of the Society for Creative Anatomy when we had it at our college. And I didn't actually, I wasn't told that it was Japanese. I was just told about this funny play where a master was trying to keep his stupid servants from eating, eating honey, called it poison. They messed things up and did in a chase. That's universal. And that was my first exposure to Kyogen. As you can see, just because this is from a different culture that most of the rest of the world didn't know anything about Kyogen until only a few centuries ago, it's the same humor that we all like. There's definitely some Kyogen plays that are very specific to Japanese culture that you have to understand the context, but then other plays like this, like Busu, it's universal. All right, Greenies, I'll call you back in at the end, but let's get back to the rest of the lecture, the boring part of the class. So thank you very much. See you guys in just a few minutes. All right, so that was Busu. That was one of the Kyogen plays. And as I mentioned, there is a variety of Kyogen plays. Um, they are often, they're often divided into different categories and different schools will have different ideas for the categories. You can see these in the notes um, that you can download, but trying to just basically be quick about the different categories, you have, you have your walkie plays, which are considered celebratory. Not necessarily very funny, um, but, they just sort of bring mirth and joy. Um, these include plays of, of gods of happiness, plays of wealthy men, um, though those can have definitely foolish because Tarakaja may be a character, plays of farmers, which often um, are dealing with uh, the idea of the agrarian society. But then we get into the funny categories of the plays. These include the daimyo plays, and daimyos are a regional lord. And the daimyos are usually considered to be these are not real daimyos because you wouldn't want to offend your own, but these usually are some actually minor, possibly fraudulent daimyo who is, thinks more of themselves, they're boastful, they're braggart, they end up in quarrels with each other or with peasants, they get tricked. Um, they, may, they may often have their own Tarokaja servants who they send in errands and of course things fail. Then we get to the Tarokaja plays, which is like the one you saw right now where Tarokaja is the main character, Often, often associated with uh, a second a secondary servant like Jirokaja or more. Tarakaja could be just a straight fool. He could be tricky. He is sort of a harlequin type. Um, his plays often involve a master sending him on an errand or telling him to do something and he messing it up. And there's a variety of them. Some are very, very close to what you just saw. There's several plays very similar to Busu where the master tries to leave the servants, tries to stop them from messing things up, they mess it up anyway. Others are the master sends Tarakaja out on a task, Tarakaja messes it up or gets tricked by a shyster. Then we have the Muko plays, the groom and son-in-law. Now, part of this is because there are several traditions in Japan. Um, one is the first ceremonial visit where the groom makes the first formal visit to the new father-in-law. Because people generally got married only once, at least traditionally, you only had one visit to your father-in-law. But your father-in-law only had one visit himself when he was a new groom, and he was clueless at the time. So you have two people who are clueless. And there's a lot of jokes, a lot of different plays that are involved this complete cluelessness. But since everyone wants to be respectful and nice, no one wants to explain, no one wants to highlight what someone's doing is wrong. Of course, this is the idea that perpetuates the generations. The father-in-law realizes, oh, my son-in-law is doing something wrong, but I don't want to embarrass him. So the son-in-law never learns he's doing something wrong. Fast forward 20 years, cycle repeats. Um, there is also the trying to choose a son-in-law place where a father is trying to find someone or trick someone into marrying them. Um, 
And uh, some of these plays can also go into, um, there's some other husband and wife married couple plays. Um, you get, uh, which can also be into the next category of plays, the ana plays or women plays. So in most Japanese literature, women are often, I should say, most historical, not modern, Japanese literature, women are usually portrayed as the weaker gender. Yes, it's sorry to say there is a lot of sexism and misogyny in historic literature, not just in Japan and across the world, but Japan isn't immune to that. What's interesting though is in Kyogen, the Japanese women are usually considered to be strong and forceful and sometimes fearful. Now, some of this could be mocking the whole shrill wife thing, but generally the women have very good reasons for the problems they have. Um, you have your age nun plays, uh, which are the, actually the only plays where you typically see a, a main character being a female character. That does happen a lot in No, but not so much in Kyogen. Um, but the nuns usually have to form a group to deal, deal with some trouble, possibly a corrupt priest, possibly a shyster. You have your married couple plays, regardless of how, whether they're old or young, new or experienced, they have some difficulty. The husband often does have to put up with a foolish wife, but the husband's foolish himself. And sometimes it's the husband who's obstinate or drunk or selfish or trying to get out of marriage. And usually the wife ends up having to basically trick him into not leaving because he is foolish and selfish. And these often still end with the wife chasing the husband off in a similar chase sequence. Um, you also then, so just like I said, we're in, in Kyogen, it flips on its head and the women are fearful. Well, the next, the next category is the demon plays, which again, contrary to most Japanese literature, the Oni are not terrifying, are not powerful, they are foolish. Even if a character, in some plays, the char other characters don't find them terrifying at all. But even if the character does find them terrifying, they are impotent and they are not, they are not going to be useful. Sometimes you wind up with Onis who just want to be, who want something nice and are tired of being uh, treated poorly because they're demons. Um, they're just misunderstood. A subcategory of these is the, the Enma, the King of Hell plays. And the idea behind these, it starts almost every play, is that too many people have been good, so no, one, no souls are going to hell. Enma goes with his horde of demons to try to find um, a sinner. And he comes across a recently departed soul, and he accuses them of being a sinner for some reason. The soul then tricks Enma, Enma into usually being chased off by his own demons. So again, Enma should be a powerful figure, but he is a foolish character. In a similar regard, we have the Yamabushi. Real life Yamabushi were, were mountain priests. Um, they were an offshoot of Tantric Buddhism, and they were travelers who were considered to be incredibly powerful, both um, physically with a sword, also with mystic arts, that they could control um, uh, various elements and control the land and control nature. And you wanted them if you had a problem, but you feared angering them. So you were always afraid to visit them. They wore grandiose costumes and they often were kind of pompous and egotistical because they knew that they were feared and that they were wanted. This is the real life Yamabushi. So in Kyogen, they are completely made fun of. They are braggarts while not getting anything done. They can talk spells that never work or make things worse. Um, and again, that usually ends with them having caused, caused a worse problem and then being chased off stage. Our next category of plays are the priest plays. And we've been talking a bit about Japanese religion because it does tie in with um, uh, performing arts quite some time. So there is a lot of sincere priests, of course, in Japan, but also around the time of Kyogen giving a rise, you had a lot of men who didn't want to be priests. They may have failed their original careers. They may have been just faking it, just like the performing arts I mentioned earlier. They may have just been trying to trick people for money. They may have just been desperate for a job. They may have been forced into it for some situation. So oftentimes priests in Kyogen plays are not, are not meant to mock real priests. They're meant to mock these shysters who just get jobs or pose as priests. So the character still talks about religious elements, but is probably selfish and greedy or full of anger or full of lust. Well, 
I wouldn't necessarily say, say lust because I said these plays are not supposed to be body, but you do occasionally have men who have interest in women they probably shouldn't, which does kind of count. A subcategory of these, which is also one of our favorite plays, is the acolyte plays, where whether it's a real priest or not, their acolyte is a fool and keeps messing things up. Uh, the next category is actually the most controversial one. That is the zapto of the blind men plays. Now, part of that does have an issue today because of cultural sensibilities, understandably so. But throughout much of Japanese history, blind men, um, they were often not looked kindly upon. Uh, anybody who had a disformity or a disfigurement or a disability or something that was sort of a not normal, as was defined, often had some problems in society. Could be ostracized, could have difficulties, could be considered to be less intelligent regardless of anything. This is not just this, not just in Japan, this happened across the world. But a lot of blind men actually did become performers because you could do acting and musician and even some uh, tumbling and all that, even if you had had this. But they were often travelers, they were often mistreated sometimes. So in Kyogen, they were often mistreated by both family and strangers. They were teased, they were swindled, they were even beaten. And that, that seems horrible when you think about it today. But a lot of these plays, how it ended is the blind men would have, would, would have some victory. It's possible that they would get the comeuppance on the shyster who, to, who did something to them. But even if they didn't, there's this idea that despite all their difficulties in life and the fact that everyone who's against them is actually more capable, they have their full vision. So the people who, have, who can see are actually the cruel people. They're, they're wrong. And the blind man, regardless of how much torment he suffered, he ends the play still happy and pleased and honorable and respectful and optimistic. So it kind of, it's maybe not so comedic, but it kind of puts down a point that just because you have a disability doesn't mean you can't be a great person. And just because you don't have a disability doesn't mean you can't be a horrible person. So there's a little bit of an artistic metaphor there. Now our last category of, of Kyogen plays is sort of the miscellaneous plays. Um, doesn't mean that these were of less quality or anything, it's just and some of these are very very loved, it's just that these plays didn't have as tight a category. So you'll see bandits and you'll see um, living plants and objects, uh, you'll see like for characters, there's one play that we actually actually love that's called the Battle of Fruits and Vegetables. All the characters are fruits and vegetables and they come into a conflict. And in the end, they are chased off by a cold gust of wind. Great farce. What category do you put it in? Uh, a subset of even these plays is you get the plays that are basically a parody of a no play. Uh, the example being a no play is going to end up having a a character who is, re is you discover this, this character that you met in the first act is actually the ghost of this ancient warrior who died in this epic battle, and he's a legendary figure in history, and you learn all about him through the course of the play. Kyogen will do that same thing with intense choreography and possibly music and possibly a chorus, except it's about a cicada or some other kind of animal. It takes this epic nature of it and applies it to something that is not epic. But it's but you don't see those as often, and especially because they are take a little harder to do. I did mention that chorus, so let me jump in and also explain that now we've covered categories of, of Kyogen plays. What are what is the acting of a Kyogen play? Well, that's when we have um, we don't as I said when we started off Busu, we don't generally have character names, but even in the scripts or descriptions they often don't even use what they are. So in the play we saw, we had a master, Tyrakaja, and Jirakaja. But it could have also been a priest, a shop owner, a husband, a wife, a father-in-law. But usually what happens is in, the, in Kyogen plays, and it's the same in no plays, although they use slightly different terms, is we have these descriptors. You have the Shite, who is the main actor, often the first who appears, though that wasn't the case in Busu. The Ado, which is a supporting actor, 
the co-adult, which is a secondary supporting actor, sometimes more, more of them, the kolkata, which is additional roles, which are often speechless, and the jolte, which is a chorus, um, not used that much in Kyogen, often used in sort of the uh, parodies of no. Now there's one more type of actor, but that technically doesn't appear in Kyogen. That is the I Kyogen. And the I Kyogen actor actually appears in no. So there is this element of Kyogen that happens in no place. What you saw in Busu, it was a very short play. In a no play, it would be a multi, multi act longer piece. Each act would probably be longer than um, a typical Kyogen play, except possibly the, the middle, middle act, usually three. The first act, our main characters encounter a situation. They encounter an old traveling woman, they encounter a possible ghost, they encounter something. Then you get into the middle of middle of the middle of the play. And this is where the I Kyogen character comes out. So an example being the actor is uh, the first the main actor is traveling, encounters something strange, where this stuff's going on, I'm confused. I've heard a weird story, I don't know what's going on. The weirdness, the the ghost, whatever leaves. I Kyogen actor comes out doesn't speak in the chants, doesn't speak in as much rhythm, doesn't speak with musical accompaniment. It's basically just say, hey, you know, I'm a local villager here. Please meet you, traveler. What strange thing did I just see? Oh, all right, let me tell you the history of this place. And they'll explain it in a bit more of a lighthearted, it's not necessarily comedic sometimes, yes, sometimes no, but more straightforward way of, of what happened. They'll bid the traveler to do and they'll leave. Then we get to the final act of the no play, which usually involves, oh, now the ghost has appeared as that ancient warrior, or now this, uh, this seemingly woman is actually revealed to be a demon or a witch. Part of the reason for the I, for the I Kyogen portion of the play is to provide the audience with that more straightforward explanation. The other reason is because that character we saw in Act 1 has now been transformed in Act, in act 3. So if they were a seemingly ghostly figure, in Act 1, they're now dressed as the ancient warrior in Act 2. Or they were an old woman in Act 1, they're now the demon in Act 3. Same actor, elaborate costume, knows all about the elaborate costumes, which is something that Kabuki carries over. Kyogen, not so much. One, it's shorter, it's simpler, and it's a lot more down to earth. Especially down to earth, because to me, that's the biggest di difference. Kyogen is often about the huge. It's about epic stories are about huge conflicts, whether it's a personal or widespread conflict. Kyogen is about humans. It's a sitcom. It's just a situational incident that happens at a very, very like low, minor level. And that's the true whether or not it's silly servants, whether or not it's newly wed couples, or even gods and demons. Because even, even everything in Kyogen is human. There's a Kyogen about a thunder god, the fearsome um, powerful thunder god who falls out of the clouds and hurts his butt. That's the play. Demons who want to read poetry or have a tea ceremony. Fruits and vegetables who want to have a collection, want to get together and have a party. There, it's all humanness, human nature, and that's sort of the helpful contrast between them. So that's, that's the general structures of Kyogen. Um, I want to also do, 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 show you quickly once I can bring it back up. A few more elements of Kyogen plays. I'm just getting that shared screen thing going on again. Where are we? So we, I showed you a little about, about this before. But this is your basic structure of of a Kyogen stage, looking at it not from a diagram. It is simple. The actors would perform in the central location. If we had musicians, they'd be in the far back or they'd be off to stage left. There is very little scenery on a Kyogen stage, um, other than those pillars, except for the tree in the background. That is almost on every single Kyogen stage you'd ever see. Let's see if I can go back. Yay, don't let me go back. Wrong way. There we go. Yay, Zoom. 
as you see, in these four different Kyogen stages, some indoors, some outdoors, they all have the tree. And they also all have a very similar setup for, for the, the, the little shrine temple, temple awning where the audience is. But that tree is not so much a scenery piece as just sort of a representation. It is, um, most, most play, plays don't necessarily take place in a forest, they don't use the tree, but it's often your only scenery on stage. Occasionally you'll have some furniture or you'll have, especially, this is more common in, in No, but you still have some in Kyogen. But that tree is your basics, basics scenery that you see. The other main element that you may think about is masks. When you think about no theater, or even think about some of the Western community theaters, you think masks. Now, no one in Booster was wearing a mask. That is an important reason, because masks are not actually that common in Kyogen. Sadful, because we love masks. Masks in uh, No are on almost every character, with the exception of possibly the main character at times, and often the I Kyogen. And that character who transforms from the ghost, the warrior, the woman, to the demon, etc., would usually wear more than one mask. Well, in Kyogen, most of the time, masks are only worn by the non-human characters. So if you have a husband and wife, you have a merchant, you have a master and servants, they are maskless. The, the only time is if you really want to emphasize like a very old woman or man. But here, as we see the masks, we have masks for gods and demons, masks for spirits, masks for animal characters, um, and we do occasionally have masks for women. But you don't generally don't see masks for for just regular human characters. Yes, in traditional Kyogen, all the actors were male. As I said, it's the time it was. This is also true for a lot of Western theater. You will even see that today in a lot of the schools that have a lineage. They'll still be having male actors play the women. And how they disguise themselves as women was actually an elaborate, well, I shouldn't say very elaborate, but a specialized headdress, which they basically just had a cap that had two fabric streams that were hung down to mimic hair. Nowadays, sure, if you're going to try to do Kyogen, cast women. Feel free to do that. And don't also feel a need to cast to specify gender roles. We had one, one of our um, male servants, Taro Kaja, was played by a woman today. And we've definitely had, um, we've had male actors play female characters, female actors play male characters, nine binary, binary actors play everyone. As we've seen in the SCA quite often, we don't do Shakespeare with just the male cast anymore. So there's no real reason to do Kyogen. Um, and that actually brings me to my next point is, don't feel like you need to be perfect to do Kyogen. Yes, if you go and watch videos and even look at photographs, you'll see such great and elaborate costumes in professional stage, staging. But many of these people have been doing it their entire lives. They grew up in this art. None of us did. None of us are going to be that refined in performance. And that's true for most things. When we do performing front arts in the SCA, we don't actually do it usually with full experience. We're doing this just for the SCA. And some people, they're worried. They're worried they won't be as great, or they're worried that they, they'll pale in comparison. But that's, that's not the point. The point is to do it. The point is to enjoy doing it, like doing it, and provide entertainment for other people, as well as a representation of a historic art. So what you saw here today, I mean, this wasn't our best performance of Busu. I mean, the acting was good, but the staging wasn't as good as we could have been. And I'm sure I'm not teaching this class as much as, it, as well as if I had an audience in front of me. But we can still do it, and we can bring it out there. And that mindset is the same whether we're in person or not. It's better to try and do it, and your audience will still be amused and laugh, than to just not do it and to worry about the quality. Because you're never going to have no quality if you don't try. So in the end, that's what Kyogen is. It's meant to bring mirth. It's meant to bring laughter and lighten the mood, especially during a series of more serious traumatic events. And right now, we definitely can use all that. So we love Kyogen. Um, it's pretty simple to do. Uh, if you wish to actually learn more about Kyogen yourself, you can definitely find lots of material. And I can actually quickly flash up for you a bibliography.
on the screen, which if you go and download the notes I mentioned before, you can also find them. But here is just a small selection of notes and a few websites where you can find some interesting material. Um, I highly recommend getting uh, Don Kenny's Guide to Kilgan. That's the book that has a few, it has a, almost 200 short summaries of plays, including character lists and, well, and much of the action. It's what we use, but a lot of these books um, uh, will give you a good insight. And you can find many of them from local libraries or from bookstores. You can find videos online to watch Kilgan performances um, and other docu documents as you're available. But I definitely recommend going out and trying it. We don't have the exact Kilgan garb. We don't have a Kilgan stage. We still like doing it. We like teaching it. We like performing it. Um, we're obviously doing it more improvised than you'll see most schools do today. But it's something that you can do. You can take this home to your local baronies and shires and cantons. Just get a few people. Three people was all that needed. There are some Kilgan plays with two people, two characters. Others, you need more. But if you want to do it, just do it. And if for some reason you feel you can't do the Japanese, we've taken a lot of these plays because I said that said it's universal humor and transformed them into other other arts. If you give me someone dressed in medieval garb, a master and two foolish servants dressed in dressed in medieval garb, and basically do busu, it's the same. So we encourage you to, to take what you learn, and if you're intrigued and inspired, go out there and act and do it. So you can get a few more notes in my class. You can always email me, um, lazi at case.edu, L-A-Z-Z-I at case.edu. If for some reason you can't access the file or have any questions. Uh, but I think we'll wrap up the class right now and I thank you for watching. I'm going to bring back the Confused Greenies so that we can um, see if they have any questions or anything more they wish to comment on. Uh, but we're about wrapping it up. Greenies, come back on. You have any questions? I mean, they, Why is this question? that's my question. It's Cleveland. I'm not sure it's blue. That's a valid point. But they've um they they've done Kyogen with me for quite some time now, so they may not necessarily have questions. But I can't ask any of you out there for questions because this is a recording. <laughs> or if you guys. Do ask me questions I see right now. I'm going to be very suspicious of the security of the software. Once this so. goes up on YouTube, because it will, go ahead and post them in the comments. Yeah, you can post them down down there in the comments. Yes, Erin. Um, there's, I saw from your photos that there are indoor stages and outdoor stages. Yes. Were there any plays that were only performed indoor or any place that were only performed outdoor? I am not aware of a distinction, but that does not mean that's, that it's untrue. Um, I think that it's the case of it's just where they decided to build a stage. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters for which plays they do, but I don't know for sure. Definitely, I've definitely seen outdoor set plays performed on indoor stages. Another question? Yes. Do we know how far back in the evolution of the theater form the posts were first incorporated? I've actually been asked that before, and I meant to look it up. I'm not positive. Well, now you've got even more motivation. <laughs> hey! I do have a question uh, myself. Um, yes. I know that uh, the Japanese have borrowed a lot of things from the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Are there any aspects of No or Kyogen that were borrowed from the Chinese? Um, yes. For one, uh, a lot of the the pre the the, the imagine the prehistory the predecessor arts to to No and Kyogen definitely was influenced by successive waves of Chinese of. A Chinese influence. That's where you got your um, your your Sangaku to become Sarugaku, which was increasingly combined with other waves of Chinese music and Chinese literature. You also have that uh, Buddhism, which is literature. Buddhism, which also brought literature in general to Japan. Japan, 
Japan did not have a writing system until Buddhism came over. And to be able to read the Buddhist scripts, they, um, they had to learn language and they had to start developing their own written system based on Chinese to have a language. But this also meant that this Buddhism is very influential in the overall increasing education of Japan. So now by this, by the point, by the time you get to know Kyogen, it's been incorporated for centuries, but um, you could easily say that Shinto is the native Japanese religion, whereas Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism is an adapted, um, uh, borrowed religion. And for anyone who doesn't know, Japan is actually very good about incorporating multiple religions. Some people would say they're more Buddhist, some people would say they're more Shinto, but many people would easily say they're both. And it kind of depends upon what you're doing and when you're doing it. Um, for different ceremonies, you would do both, you would either do Buddhism or Shinto. Uh, there are some plays that actually kind of poke a little bit of fun of this. There's one particular play where, where both a Buddhist priest and a Shinto priestess are arriving at, by, by chance, arriving at the same house at the same time to offer a blessing, and they're getting in each other's way. It's not that they're trying to compete for the best religion, it's just that they're both doing a task that happens to be getting in each other's way. Uh, there's definitely a lot of Buddhist elements in some of the more mythological parts of, of the Kyogen plays, and there's a few Kyogen plays that actually feature, supposedly feature Chinese characters. Now, they're definitely influenced by, um, they're definitely played by Japanese actors, at least traditionally, but the idea like somebody um, is married to a Chinese person or there's a Chinese dignitary visiting, um, there is some Kyogen costumes that are meant to be Chinese um, costumes. So you do see elements of that. Now, I would say all of the mythological stories that show up in, um, in Kyogen are all Japanese. They've been Japanese for a while. Whether they were inspired by Chinese earlier, that is very that is likely and probably common. But I wouldn't say that anyone picked up a recently Chinese story that hadn't been introduced to Japan and then made a Kyogen out of it. No is probably similar, but maybe more closely tied to getting some more recent stories because No was less about you know, the human, it was less about the person on the ground, just the person in the street, and more about actual, lo actual literature, stories that was often well known. Um, again, I think most of these are still Japanese stories, especially the historical ones, but they may have incorporated a bit more of direct Chinese. Now, most of the Chinese stories I know about, know from this time period, I wouldn't say show up in No in Kyogen, but I haven't done a full amount of research for it. So there's definitely an influence, but I think the influence was sort of permeated uh, Japanese culture by the time that we got to Ziami and Kayami. That sounds good. I have a question. Yes. Um, this is actually more about the modern era of No and Kyogen. Um, as we know, No and Kyogen got started way back in what in Western Europe we would call the medieval and renaissance period. Mm -hmm. um, but there are still people in Japan doing no Kyogen today. Um, I am wondering back in when, when it got started, when the arts got started in the medieval renaissance era, there were no women on stage in No and Kyogen, but my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in the modern era, some No and Kyogen companies are out putting women on stage. I'm wondering if is that correct, and if so, if you know when that got started in the modern era. All right. Um, I haven't I haven't looked up full details about modern schools. I do know that some of if some if not all of the modern schools that can actually date themselves back to the medieval feudal era of Japan, um, doing no and Kyogen, like that some if not all of them still only have male actors. It's still considered a male tradition, and Japan loves its traditions. Now that being said. There are definitely theaters in Japan that also do at least know, and I presume also presume Kyogen, who have 
been more open about who they cast. So there's definitely women in Japan who have done no and Kyogen. But I don't want to say for sure that they're part of any traditional school and maybe a more recent school. I have, I want to say, and I don't have the records in front of me, so I'd have to look it up. I want to say that at least by the 19th century, there was even some theaters that were women only, sort of as in response to the men only theaters. Now, whether these were doing no and Kyogen, I'm not positive. I know in more recent years, there's, there is a rise of women only actor theaters. Um, the uh, Takurazua, something like that, review. Um, now, they do a lot more modern pieces, but they definitely, I've seen some of their shows that have, have some kabuki elements to them. And I think that when kabuki started, it might have been male only as well. And I don't know about today. I haven't studied kabuki as much as I want since it's technically a post SCA period. But um, I do know that there's definitely women who do acting in it. And I've, um, the actual, no professionals that I personally met have not been Japanese. They've been Americans who have learned, although learned as probably as well as you can, that it's their profession. They've they've dedicated their lives to learning it, to teaching it. Um, There's probably as well as you can if you're not actually born into a school and raised in this way. And some of them have been women, and there's been no problem, at least in the international community, for women to also study and perform no in Kyogen. I have to do more research about what happens in Japan. And I want to say, I think I've also heard that there's some performing arts that women did back in period, but I don't know if any of it was, was what we would call theatrical. It may have been more music and poetry reading than actual stage theater. But I'm not positive. Like, I, I want to do more research on the earlier Sarugaku, and I haven't done that yet. So might find out some more stuff. And as we've seen in other theaters, Sometimes this ban on women acting on stage was not as universal as the history books like to paint it. On the flip side, the history books often ignore giving us documentation about some of that. Like there was definitely instances of women who acted in the Middle Ages in Europe before uh, Camille dell'arte, but the history kind of just tries to gloss over that or ignore it. So this may have happened in Japan as well, and I just you know, it's hard to come across it, especially if you don't really speak Japanese that well. Yes, Aaron. Well, not so much a question as an observation, but uh, in terms of modern um, re-implementations of Kyogen, when I was looking for some video recordings of Busu to refresh my memory, um, the first one I found was actually a school that was performing the play in Okinawan, the Okinawan language, and that's something that a lot of schools are apparently doing to help preserve uh, traditional minority languages in Japan, is that they're performing and recording uh, Kyogen in these uh, endangered languages. Hmm. Cool. I had not heard of that. That's interesting. I had definitely not heard of that before. Um, and it was specifically Kyogen, not no Kyogen? Um, the recording, at least, was just of a performance of Busu. Hmm. Well, that that potentially is also because Kyogen is very accessible to children, and it's shorter. It's it's I don't want to call it simpler because comedic com comedy acting is not necessarily simple, but there's fewer overall elements because you don't have to have musicians and you don't have to have a rhythmic chanting that often appears in no place. Um, so I could, I could easily see how it's a bit more accessible. The other aspect is, even if you were to watch a no play in Japan today, it's probably being spoken in a much older dialect. There definitely are some, some native Japanese speakers who still do not entirely understand what they're listening to in a no play because the dialect has shifted over time and they're still using some very old, old scripts. And part of that's because just like we talk about Shakespeare has, has iambic pentameter, um, no plays have a very rhythmic chanting structure. Some people have even said, and I don't know how accurate the statement is, that if you were to get into such a meditative state watching a no play and fall asleep, that's actually considered a victory for the performers. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it's really against what we think about our sensibilities for stage. But that's, that's part, that is part of why when you get a program in a modern day no, no play, it'll explain a little bit more about what's happening 
in, in the play, a bit more of the plot line. And when that eye choking comes in in the middle of the play, they'll be they'll explain it in a much in a modern vernacular. They'll explain it clearly without chanting, without stylization. They'll just be going, "Oh yeah, that thing that happened in Act One that you fell asleep sleep through because you couldn't understand it anyway." Let me explain it for you. And Great exposition. <laughs> and Kyogen plays are are very similar. Is that they are spoken in a much more common vernacular because the idea is supposed to be accessible to the everyday person. It's not epic. It's not serious. It's not. It's focused on you. It's just everyday activity. So I can easily see how that would be a lot more accessible to changing the language or dialect into the whatever the local performers have. Um, but that's that's a lot of fun to think about. To think about that being uh, how Kyogen is being used today. Um, this is also post period antidote, but it reminds me part of the reason why we even still have no in Kyogen as prevalent in Japan today is because of it's one of the good contributions the United States of America brought to Japan in the 19th century. Because at that time, Kabuki was outpacing no, outpacing no Kyogen as the prominent performing arts, especially because no Kyogen was so associated with the Tokugawa shogunate period that when that, um, that era was falling, the Meiji Restoration, some of the things that were considered part of the court were also rolling out of favor. But former president Ulysses S. Grant went to Japan in the decades after Japan opened itself up to the West again. And he, they brought him to see various cultural aspects. And one of the things he saw was no. And it reminded him of European opera. Like I said, it's very stylized, very chanting, kind of slow moving, um, lots of music accompaniment. It reminded him of opera, which he quite liked. And he, he raved about the no performance he saw. And since at this time, a lot of Japanese were trying to uh, court um, Western and American influence because a former United States president said he liked no, suddenly no and thus Kyogen came back into style. And it's possible it would have faded away before the 21st century, at least I'm sure it would have been remembered historically, but it may have not had a continuous lineage if it wasn't for that revitalization that happened in the late 19th century. Yes. Kabuki definitely um, still is considered to be more of a common historical performing arts than no, Ky than no and Kyogen, but we still have no Kyogen today in a lineage that dates back um, hundreds of years, and that's, that's pretty cool. Indeed. Anything else, guys? Not for me. All right. I think well, that's about it. Um, Amazingly, if I don't have a clock in front of me, I think the class went a little bit longer than I expected, but it's video you can watch at your leisure. Mm -hmm. um, so I wish to again um, say uh, arigato gozaimasu to the members of Iverde Confuzi. Arigato gozaimasu. That being, <laughs> that being uh, Forrester James Barkley, um, aka Chunk, Chuck Minch playing the master, Lady Eleanor de Saint Remy, aka Megan M. Matthews playing Tyra Kaja, and Lord Aaron of the Clefland, aka Aaron Kaiser, <laughs> um, playing Jiro Kaja, and I myself, not playing anyone but the instructor, have been Nicola Bartolazzi, and I wish to thank again the members of Players Patrick Theatre Company for joining us here today, and I wish to thank all of you who will be watching this video, and hopefully you can go home and once everything opens back up and maybe find some people in your local group who want to do some Japanese theater, because seriously, we don't have enough Japanese theater going on in the Society for Creative Anachronism. We should. It's awesome. Just go ahead and do it. And look for Players Patchwork Theater Company, AKA the Confused Greenies, AKA in the Society for Creative Anachronism, Iverdi Confusi, coming at you in more videos to come. Even after the health crisis is over, we hope to make more videos to bring more laughter and joy to the world because we're always going to need it, whether this social distancing stuff is going on for as a necessity or not. Just remember, laugh while you learn, learn while you laugh. laugh. All right. Jane. Jane. Jane.